second class or second session. Um, it's my pleasure to be with you again. Um, wow, I, I wonder how your weekend was because uh, um, I heard that the public places have closed down already again, um, the parks and beaches and uh, even uh, some of the hiking trails. Uh, they were actually counting heads and they were taking only reservation and rejecting other people who just came without appointments or uh, without a reservation, right? So, um, hope uh, you had a chance to spend time, uh, meaningful time, with your family and friends still. Um, perhaps like um, in your homes, um, in your own backyards, or um, somewhere that uh, is, is still open, right? So, um, as we're facing uh, more difficult situations, uh, we're, as we're anticipating more difficult situations, and environments. Um, let's uh, lift up this situation in God's hands because ultimately God is the one who is sovereign. God is the one who actually um, can let it continue or reverse the situation for us. And uh, uh, you and I um, are called to pray. Actually, we are called to make a difference through what we do and what we say and through our prayers. So um, let's lift up our prayers, God. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for uh, your grace and mercy. Lord, your mercy is new every day, even in the midst of uh, um, anticipating another lockdown. Lord, we still keep our hopes high because you are the one who brings hope. You are the one who brings um, hope to the hopeless and uh, joy to the joyless. Um, you bring peace to those people who are worried and without peace and so we ask you for your presence Lord God in this classroom during today's session especially and uh, Father God help us not be numb about the situation that it has been going, going on for a long time and we don't see the end to it and the pandemic is becoming worse uh, over the globe um, Lord we not only look at the physical circumstances but look uh, up to you and um, give us your spiritual perspective so that we don't just focus on the earthly events but rather what's causing behind what we what we need to do and even if we don't understand the exact cause or uh, what we should be doing in the midst of this lord uh, we want to focus all our attention on you we want to worship you with your new heart we want to put you as the first priority we don't want our minds and hearts to be plagued with the idols of this world. So cleanse us and cover us with your blood. And Father God, help us not go astray or lose hope, but rather hold on to you and find peace and hope in you. And continue to pray and continue to knock on the door of the heaven as a church community so that we can make a difference through what we do and what we say and especially through the means of prayers that you have allowed us as a privilege. Father God, we dedicate this time in your hands. May you speak to each one of us, Father. We thank you, Lord, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, so um, last time we talked about Genesis chapter 1, um, and I hope that you got something out of it. And uh, we weren't quite uh, finished with chapter 1, uh, last time so um, yes we talked about the fact that the Bible uh, there are various versions of the Bible right the Bible was written a long time ago and the Bible was written in different languages and um, different cultures um, different culture Hebraic um, Jewish culture right um, Jesus probably spoke in the Aramaic language the New Testament was in Greek the Old Testament was in um, Hebrew, the goal of the Bible interpretation is to understand the author's original intention, right? And how it was understood by the original audience. And so that's, that's not full. Um, if you understand this, then you got something out of class. Yeah, and we also talked about um, the various versions of the Bible, which is on chapter 1, on Roman numeral 2, um, if you don't have your books yet, uh, please try to get your books because um, 
it's going to be very important for you to have the book um, so that you know how to follow through. And especially if you're kind of new to the materials that I'm teaching, or even if you are not new, but um, you probably have forgotten um, some, some, some chunks of it because our memory is kind of limited. Um, I heard from my uh, friend that, well, it's not just from my friend. Um, it, I'm just giving you a, an example, but it is uh, actually um, proven scientifically that after 48 hours, which is two days, um, of having memorized certain things, the memory starts uh, fading away. We lose probably 50% of what we have memorized two days ago. And then uh, a week later, it's pretty much, um, we have forgotten almost everything. Yeah. And of course, um, remembering comes with rep repetition and intentional repetition, I'm trying to really remember it. And so um, even those uh, who are coming, um, you know, who've taken my classes before and have heard this part before, um, probably some of you feel that this is kind of new. Yeah. And especially the various versions of the Bible, um, we have not talked about it in the past. It was uh, in, in the curriculum, but um, because I did not want to confuse you, I did not want to kind of overwhelm you with too much information. So um, I tried to kind of not talk about it. But this time we're gonna uh, we're gonna you know, uh, go more in detail, and so it's uh, worthwhile for you to actually uh, buy the book, and um, it is needed for your educational purposes, but also later for other purposes as well. Um, if you understand what I mean. So, um, so as a brief review, we talked about the various versions of the Bible. We, we weren't able to cover everything, but we cover Septuagint, right? Septuagint which is a Greek translation of the Old Testament, and it was uh, um, translated in Koine Greek, the common every, everyday language, and uh, it dates back to 3 um, BC. Yeah. It's traditionally dated to the reign of Ptolemy II, uh, Philadelphus of Egypt. So he was, uh, uh, he was an Egyptian king, and he actually was very much interested in uh, collecting all the important documents and literatures uh, from all around the world. And he actually called uh, 72 translators, uh, really uh, renowned, really accurate, you know, well-respected and uh, you know, highly skillful, 72 translators, and gathered them and told them, why don't you translate this into uh, Greek language so that I can read it, you know, I can't read Hebrew, but I can read Greek, right? Because it was a Greco-Roman uh, world. And so he commissioned the royal librarian, Demetrius of Belarus, and he in, in turn uh, called um, 72 men, uh, well, Eliezer, the high priest at, Jer uh, at Jerusalem, and six elders of each tribe. And so um, then Eliezer gathered um, 72 men, and to um, all the other, including himself, and, translated into Greek. Um, completed in 72 days. Um, I did, uh, we don't know how exactly, but then um, according to the record, um, it says uh, uh, it was completed in 72 days. So then um, Septuagint, Sept uh, means 70, right? The oldest manuscript of the Septuagint, Septuagint was discovered in Bayonne, France in 1939. So we talked about this. Um, now, uh, it's time for us to kind of talk about Latin Vulgate. So now, uh, because the universal language at that time was just like we're speaking English most, mostly, so um, in an Olympic game or uh, United Nations conferences or um, any important world events uh, involve uh, translate, translation into several languages. And the key languages are English, French, um, English and French for now, right? Um, but in the past, it was Greek. And so now that it was uh, translated to Greek, now so many people were able to, if they were, if they wanted, they could pick it up and start reading. So the Bible became kind of, um, the Bible became kind of uh, wide, widely known, uh, widely known um, literature. Uh, a book uh, among the nations, 
Uh, before we talk about Latin Vulgate, I want to talk about um, Genesis. Um, because, once again, understanding the, uh, the Genesis chapter 1 um, through 2 uh, is critical in um, helping us understand why we are studying the Bible. Amen. Latin Vulgate is important, yes, and we're going to talk about it, but then like, why is the Bible important for us? Um, last time we talked about the fact that it is a book um, that gives us guidance as to how to be blessed and how, how not to be, how, how to avoid curse, right? Um, because God created each one of us. Whether we recognize God or not, whether we are in Christian faith or not, God created each one of us and he wants to bless each one of us. He cherishes us. And so then he, you know, did a few things to, to communicate with us. Okay. One of the uh, first things was to allow, like to inspire these uh, prophets and these um, um, people, these uh, faithful people, like who, who are not necessarily uh, highly intellectual. I mean, there were some who were intellectual, but um, not everyone. So uh, probably like Jeremiah, um, you know, uh, some of the, you know, uh, Moses, you know, some people are really highly intelligent, you know, uh, Apostle Paul. Uh, yes, they did, they contributed to, um, to collection, you know, to, to, to writing parts of the Bible, yes, um, but they, they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. That's why the whole book of the Bible, although uh, supposedly um, it was written by many different authors over a span of time, it just, it's consistent from beginning to the end. Why? Because there's one, one person, one mind that has inspired all these people. Yes, there were intellectuals who contributed to uh, making the Bible happen, but however, um, there were some really simple-minded people who were not highly educated at all. Um, some of the prophets, um, like uh, um, Jonah or um, or even um, David, you know, um, King David, who wrote uh, so many songs, right? They were simple people. They had uh, come from either, you know, not not educated background, and and David certainly was born into this um, shepherd's family. And what what he was doing, what he, he was a shepherd boy before he was uh, anointed by king, anointed by God to become a king. And um, also in the New Testament, you can see um, that. Uh, you know, uh, Mark uh, um, and, and, and some of the disciples, actually, they were not highly educated. So Matthew was decently educated. I mean, he was a tax collector. Um, well, not highly intellectual, but, you know, was better than a fisherman, right? Um, uh, but Peter, you know, who wrote uh, First and Second Peter, um, he was a fisherman, very simple-minded person, and he certainly uh, was like a pillar of the uh, early church. And uh, he followed the footsteps of Jesus. And if you read the book of Acts, um, you can see that he stands, that stands up before uh, a crowd um, during Pentecost, right? Um, and, and he um, actually gives a speech testifying that Jesus is the Messiah, and by the way, you guys killed him, um, but now you need to really repent and believe in him and be saved. He gave that speech, um, and people were all surprised because they knew that, you know, his background, they knew that he had not been educated at all, but his speech was not only eloquent, but rather it was spirit-filled, and um, he had the authority that normally other teachers did not have. Even the teachers of the law would not have. And people were all surprised, like, I mean, we know that this person 
uh, was not educated like Apostle Paul. Yes, he was. Uh, he studied under Gamaliel. Um, well, you know, like Luke. Uh, well, we know that he uh, was a um, physician. Um, but you know, who is this Peter? <laughs> how do you see? How is it that he is? His speech is so convincing and so convicting, convicting that we can't help but uh, prostrating before God, and we're just. I don't know, I just feel like I need to really repent. And uh, many of Jesus' disciples were not educated. Well, Jesus himself was not educated. He came from uh, a, a town that did not have a good, that did not bear a good name, uh, Nazareth. What good can come out of Nazareth? You know, people said that. I think many of said that, right? And people said that. But however, um, he had no fancy background, um, and he was despised by so many people. However, when he stood in the synagogues, or when he was teaching on a mountain, wherever he was, he was, he was teaching on a boat, um, he was teaching everywhere he went. He was teaching when he was breaking the bread, um, having simple dinner, um, having, having dinner with his followers. He taught everywhere about the kingdom of God, about himself, about the Messiah, how to be saved, what heaven is like, and um, what the end times is going to look like and everything. Um, he spoke in parables. Right now, um, people were all amazed. And all these teachers of the law were jealous. We studied all day long for 30 years, 40 years, and we still don't understand certain parts of the scriptures. But how is it that he speaks so uh, intellectually and with authority? It sounds so convincing. There's nothing like we, we try to tackle him. We try to uh, really verbally attack him, to uh, throw him up, to um, test him uh, with all our knowledge and wisdom. And it was not just one person. It was not multiple people. But how is it that how is it that he is able to answer all our testing questions and uh, in such a way that we are not able to say anything anymore? <laughs> because um, Judas and his disciples, regardless of the backgrounds, they were spirit filled. They were selected by God, they were anointed by the Holy Spirit, and they did their work and did their speech by the power of the Holy Spirit, and that's how they were able to speak like highly educated people and with authority that highly educated people did not have. Now, um, so, Bible is full of wisdom. It was written by many people, but then it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Uh, we talked about the fact that last time, that in the beginning, um, they, there was God, God in three persons, God the Father, uh, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, I just suppose Genesis 1 with the book of John, the Gospel of John, to demonstrate to you there are actually um, three persons, Trinity, um, in the beginning. Yeah. And um, we also learned about the fact that um, there were repeated words in the book of Genesis. Um, day one, day two, day three, the sequence was important. And then, um, and it was good. Everything, every time he created something, God created uh, the light, let there be light. Oh, it was good. Um, he created, you know, um, the heaven and the earth, um, and it was good. Um, those words were repeat, repeated, and I told you that in Hebrew culture, um, you know, in which this Bible was written, when whenever a word is repeated, it, it means it's shouting out to the audience. This is absolutely important. Um, this is one of the key points that we want to make. Um, and why was it good? Because God the Creator Himself is good. Anybody who is good and this good person makes something, it turns out to be good. It serves a good purposes and just for the quality of the work, it is good. Um, and, um, 
and true God size because it was going to serve a wonderful purpose. Uh, well, you know, the light in the universe, you know, the stars, sun, moon, and stars, um, the fish, the trees, uh, animals, they're all precious and they themselves have inherent values. But God said it was good because he was imagining something else to come for which these things were created. And so we're going to talk about that today. Let's, uh, let me remind, uh, remind you to refresh your memory by reading this uh, passage together with you. Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was covering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the vault, water under the vault, vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the, and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. And let them be lights in the vaults of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights. The great light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. To govern the day and the night. And to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing with which the water teems and that moves about in it according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number, and fill the water in the seas, and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock and the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals which accord, each according to its kind. And it was so. Verse 25, God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds, and God saw that it was good. Verse 26, then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish and the sea, and the birds in the sky over the livestock and all the wild animals 
and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food and to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground. Everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every plant, green plant for, for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. So we're talking about Genesis chapter 1. Number two, they may rule over. Male and female. sort of touched on this last time, right? Let us, you know, this is God uh, saying uh, among the Trinity, uh, let us make humankind in our image. Uh, so let's talk about this. So um, us meaning more than one, and uh, I'm going to just briefly remind, uh, refresh your memory, uh, but it, uh, we, we already talked about this, so I'm going to actually talk about a little more um, briefly today. Meaning, God existed in creation. 
three persons. This is a very difficult concept for most of us, and therefore uh, we cannot. I um, dare not to um, analyze it. Uh, no one can really and truly analyze it. We can use, utilize some metaphors, but they're imperfect. They cannot quite capture um, how it is like. Um, some people use like clover uh, illustration. Other people use like um, water, vapor, ice type of um, illustration. Um, some people are <laughs> like three, like uh, um, like twins. You know, like not twins, but what do you um, the you know triple, triple, triplets. Uh, or other people still utilize other kinds of um, illustrations, but they don't really capture. So one thing that I can tell you for sure, um, even if it's way over our heads, um, God is only one God. So we Christ believers and Christian, as, as Christians and Christian community, we are not believing in multiple gods, right? We believe in one God, but that one God exists in three roles three roles and um, they're one and they're in perfect unity and so like if we gather as uh, even as best friends say three of us gather we are not going to completely agree on everything and we cannot read each other's minds right um, even the closest relationship like husband and wife they will not be able to read each other's minds sometimes, right? But um, God exists in three persons and he, they love each other. They're in perfect unity, perfect love. There's no dispute. There's no argument or disagreement. And um, they're not competing against each other. They're actually honoring and lifting each other up. For example, the Holy Spirit does not come and say, oh, now it's my time, it's my season. Now you communicate with me because I'm the dominant figure, especially in the end times, my role is so important. No, he doesn't do that. Holy Spirit, when you know when a person is filled by the Holy Spirit, uh, one of the first signs of that is, of course, repentance and um, boldness and sharing the gospel. But this person is really drawn to the word of God and this person um, testifies about Jesus Christ because Holy Spirit, among all other nicknames that he has, he's a comforter, counselor, he's our advocate, he is um, the everlasting, you know, um, and he is with us, you know, he, and, and he's got many um, nicknames, but among all the nicknames, he is the one that his primary role is to testify about Jesus the Son. He is like a, 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 almost like a witness, you know, um, everlasting witness, ever present witness to our hearts, to anybody who listens. Um, he testifies about Jesus Christ. And so when a person is filled by the Holy Spirit, this person is going to get up and start sharing about Jesus Christ. And therefore, the Holy Spirit it does not honor himself or glorify himself. He uh, only lifts up Jesus the Son, right? And uh, Jesus the Son, although he was in the beginning, he was with God and he co created the universe and all the creation, um, including human beings, alongside with God. And he's equal with God. He is God himself, but he did, did not take the position equal with God the Father, but he completely submitted himself to the Father's will, and he came down to the earth to live up among us. So I, I told you at the beginning of this session that there were a few things that um, God did in order to communicate his love and truth to us. One was to inspire people to uh, write the Bible so that we will be able to read. read. Uh, and nowadays in English, there are different uh, um, translated versions. You know, we're gonna talk about Latin and Vulgate, but, um, there are so many um, English Bibles out there, and um, they're translated into so many different languages now. Therefore, um, anybody has access to it, right? Now, um, that was one. Uh, another one was that uh, God Himself, 
God, God, God told Jesus, uh, you are me. Um, we're supposed to be on the throne because we are the sovereign God. We are uh, the one who exists in the heaven, heavenly realm, in the kingdom. However, why don't you go down and um, become one of our creation, which is unbelievable. Can you imagine um, yourself? Um, I don't know if you, when you were growing up, um, if you had any kind of projects, like a um, uh, model making projects or some kind of projects, right? And so um, sometimes um, we're supposed to have like a model design, like a plan for construction, you know, that, that was one of our class projects. And so we uh, utilized, uh, I'm forgetting the name of the uh, the material, but it's plastic, a special plastic that is pretty firm, and you can actually uh, use like the tacky glue or um, you know the, um, the 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 special glue to. It's very thin, you know, thin in pieces, and you can actually put pieces together to make buildings or um, to create a model of a house that, with many rooms or. Uh, and in equipment. So you can actually make that. So say um, you created a masterpiece. But would you like to become that piece? <laughs> we cease to exist. Say, can you imagine you exist? You uh, cease to exist as a human being and you turn into one of these things that you made. Would you like to be like that? Um, it, it's ridiculous. I, I, I should not be even asking this question to you because it's it's ridiculous and um, it's not worth even asking, right? Um, we certainly don't think about that and we certainly don't want to be one of the things that we created. Uh, or uh, it can be something like uh, becoming an ant. Like, um, of course, ants are God's creation and they're precious as well. However, um, can you imagine yourself becoming an ant? Because uh, that's how small we are before God's sight. Um, he breathed unto us, and that's the only difference from rest of the animals and insects and all the creation, or all the creatures. And that's the only difference. He breathed unto us. He gave us his spirit, and so we are different beings. Um, so then, um, Today I'm not going to tackle this, I'm not going to talk about uh, evolutionism and how um, groundless, how, how it has shaky foundation, um, the theory, theory does not stand, um, very, very shaky. If you just book it with just one um, scientific approach, it's going to just fall apart into different pieces, you know, it's going to shatter and we've been learning from public schools and colleges um, still like I can't imagine like I was going to college many years ago and we we earned extra credit for attending evolution seminars however even today when I see um, the college students that stay and even high schoolers they're learning um, evolutionism even to this day which is which I think is uh, pretty much nonsense let me, let me tell you that <laughs> maybe they have difficulty changing the textbooks, like striking that down is kind of um, difficult. I don't know how difficult that is, but it's just uh, not scientific at all. Um, most scientists, most solid scientists today will tell you that it does not stand. It's not worth even learning. However, um, God himself became one of the human beings that he, he created. And uh, it's worse than us becoming ants. Um, he loved the ants, and we love the ants so much we became one of the ants. You know, that's like that. Um, and he came among us. There were a few purposes that he wanted to serve. He came down for the purpose of washing away our sins, to take upon himself our sin and the punishment of eternal death so that we can be set free. Like whoever can confess and believe in their hearts that Jesus is Lord and Savior will be set free 
will be exempted from the sin and death, the bondage of sin and death, eternal death I'm talking about, eternal lake of fire, not just dying, you know, uh, because of aging, dying, you know, by natural cause or even by accidents. I'm not talking about that first death. I'm talking about the second death, um, meaning um, there's, by the way, uh, we can talk about this later. There's first birth, second birth, first death, and second death. And death and Hades, which is uh, permanently placed in the lake of fire that will not cease, and you cannot die there. You continue to exist and feel all the pain of burning um, to like into your bones, and you cannot die. Right? Um, why is there such a place? Um, it, it's a good question. I'm not going to try to answer that question today, but um, Jesus came, God himself came as one of us to take upon himself our sin and the consequences of eternal lake of fire so that you and I have a chance to, um, to believe in him and be saved from death and Hades to heaven. Now, um, there were other purposes that he served, such as um, he walked on earth. He was born in a manger, very humble. Like, I, it's a mystery. Why king of the universe, the Lord of hosts, chose to be born in a, an animal barn, you know, like a, um, and in a manger? Uh, why did he choose a place where there was no bed? Um, even the mom probably had a very difficult time giving delivery, you know. Um, she was conceived by the Holy Spirit, by the way. It was not uh, the two human beings actually um, forming a baby, but rather Mary uh, was uh, conceived by the Holy Spirit, which we can talk about another time. Now, uh, it was a cold winter, and uh, well, uh, scholars have actually uh, have done some research and some educated guessing and all that and calculated and probably Jesus was born around like September-ish rather than December but still um, uh, you know with with because sports farms don't have windows and they don't have doors it must have been a very very difficult situation in which uh, Mary gave birth and Jesus was born and was placed in that smelly uh, uh, place where horses come and feed, you know, eat on their feed. Now, um, he came so vulnerably. He wanted us to know, obviously, that he understands even the process of human development. I was in my mother's womb. I was um, born as a baby. I grew as an infant, helpless little babe that needed, completely dependent on the parents. I depended on two human beings for raising me so that I would completely understand and experience. I mean, you know, God is all knowing, like without having to come down physically and physically experiencing every step that we, you and I, experience, he, he knows, he knows. However, he chose to um, physically experience it when it was not absolutely necessary. He had to learn to walk. He probably fell several times uh, before he started walking. And uh, by the way, he was born into this carpenter's family uh, who is not highly educated, who is not highly esteemed. Mary was a godly woman and Joseph was also a very godly man. However, they did, not, they did not have higher education. They were not highly esteemed by other people in the town. And um, when Jesus grew, he had to uh, grow in spirit. He, he had to learn um, several things. And um, he found himself actually very much attracted to the Word of God because he is ultimately the truth of God, the Word of God that came, became a um, flesh with the us. Uh, not only that, because the truth sets the world free. 
because God uses his word, his truth, to make everything come into being. The whole universe was created by his word. And because um, he knows that uh, the word of God will set so many people free, um, that uh, it will lead people to truth and they will actually come back to God. And um, he loved the temple because that's where the spirit of God was. He, you know, remember Jesus the Son, Father God, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit are in perfect love relationship and perfect unity. And so whenever he went to the temple where the special of God's pres special presence of God was there. So um, in those times, because it was before Pentecost, it was before the Holy Spirit was pour, uh, poured upon the believers. Um, there was such a special presence of God in the temples. And even today, if you go to certain places where people always gather and worship, people always gather in prayer, pray, you can feel a strong presence, stronger presence of God. And so, yes, God exists in all the universe. Like he is, There is no place where he, he does not exist. Otherwise, it would be like hell. Where he does not exist is hell. So um, he exists in the whole universe. However, his special presence was in the temple. And uh, uh, that's probably why Jesus loved to be in the temple. And uh, during those three important uh, festivals or um, special days of celebration, um, all the Jewish people would gather, come to Jerusalem and go to the temple. And as faithful Jewish people, faithful Jews, um, Jesus' parents, um, Mary, and um, you know, although Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, um, sort of his um, surrogate father, you know, like um, Mary's, uh, Mary's husband, actually, uh, as faithful people, also came to Jerusalem in order to uh, keep their laws and to be faithful to God. Now, as they were leaving, they assumed that uh, the, the 12-year-old Jesus uh, would just be with them. To, uh, he would follow them because he was, um, he was tempted in every way, but he was without sin. There was only one human being on this earth who did not sin against God, who did not sin in any sense. Of course, he did not break uh, break God's laws, and I have to be careful when I say this because he intentionally sometimes broke Sabbath and other laws because he was sick and tired of these Pharisees and Sadducees and the teachers of the law who were so proud and they were uh, religious in forms, but their hearts were not with God. They, their hearts were against God and they were just, they wanted people's recognition and reputation and respect. They wanted to hear good words from people that they pretended to be religious and they pretended to be faithful and made the law so difficult to keep that no one could ever keep. So Jesus was sick and tired of that. He broke the laws in order to challenge them, in order to uh, demonstrate the fact that their hearts were corrupt and things like that. But otherwise, he was very faithful um, to keeping the laws. He, he himself actually declared that. Do you think that I came to abolish the laws? No, the opposite. I came to fulfill the laws. I love the love, laws of God. So um, his heart is well reflected in King David's Psalms. Well, the Psalms were written probably before he became a king too, you know, uh, he, yeah. Anyway, so, um, your word is a lamp to my feet light into my path. Your word is sweeter than honey to my lips. And these are the confessions. These are the, uh, the, the insights and um, like it, this, these were honest feelings that David had. And when he wrote these things, it was not just his personal opinion. It was not, he was not just become, uh, being poetic, although his sounds are very poetic. He was, that was not his intention, I don't think. He was inspired by the Spirit of God, who is God himself. 
and David, in, in fact, is called a man after God's own heart. And so when he said, your word is a lamp to my feet, light into my path, and your love, I love your word. I'd rather be in your temple, uh, in your presence, uh, one day, one day in, in your court, is better than a thousand elsewhere, a thousand years elsewhere. Um, I'd rather be in your presence, and I'd rather choose your word, because your word is sweeter than honey to my lips. Now, um, that's how God thinks of his own word. Now, um, Jesus loved the word, and that's why wherever he went, he, he preached and taught, right? And also, um, he uh, was able to uh, demonstrate many, many miracles by the word of God, right? Um, and he loved to be in the temple where God's presence was. Just, you know, think about it. That's where he experiences the Trinity, right? Special presence of Trinity. Now, um, so his parents assumed that he was following, but then later on, he was like, in the, well, in the middle of their journey back to their hometown, they were like, where is Jesus? Oh, where is he? Like, we lost him. So they must have been really concerned and worried, and they actually started making their way back to Jerusalem, to the temple, and they found Jesus there, actually conversing with the teachers of the laws, right? Um, Jesus, once again, was not educated, but he loved the word of God, and he was really well-versed. Um, well, those are the, the, uh, the word of himself, right? He is the word. He actually, by his spirit, um, all these authors were inspired to you know, write the Bible, and therefore, it was his own word, and no wonder he was so well-versed. It's like an author of uh, a book that became a bestseller, and you go to um, show up at this uh, uh, public, uh, publication, uh, like, publication conference, you know, like, a, uh, where people come and actually uh, celebrate your new release of your book. And the author, of course, knows the content very well, by heart. And whenever people ask him questions, he is able to answer all the questions, right? Um, well, sometimes he may say, or she may say, oh, I, I didn't really um, have that in mind when I wrote this part. He may say, oh, you know what? Uh, maybe that content can be covered in my sequel. <laughs> but other than that, um, he would say so eloquently, um, you know, all the answers to all the questions. What was your intention, you know, behind this uh, passage? You know, like this paragraph, uh, it sounds really profound and really impressive. Now explain to us what it really means. Um, well, you uh, utilize symbolism, a lot of metaphors in this book, uh, which is really intriguing. Now explain to us what this symbolism and uh, metaphors mean. And the author, well, you don't, he doesn't have to look up dictionaries. He doesn't have to ask anybody. He doesn't have to Google anything because it was his original design. Like it, it was his. Uh, on his mind, it was conceived. The, the book was conceived in his own intellect, in his own mind, that he's able to answer all the questions. And that's how Jesus was. And he was conversing, as a 12-year-old boy, he was conversing with all the teachers of the laws. Number one, because he loved the Word of God. Number two, because he was so wise and he was so well-versed in the materials. Number three, um, was probably to, to even challenge them. I mean, I, the Bible does not specifically mention about that, but probably he wanted to challenge people for their misunderstanding of the word, or um, if they were actually pretending, like uh, if they were being hypocrites, um, or uh, if they had false teaching, he probably wanted to challenge them as well. So, uh, Joseph and Mary find, find them, find him, in the temple, and they're like, why have you done this? Why are you sitting here instead of following us? We were very much worried. Yes, any parent would be worried if your 12-year-old disappears, right? And Jesus, he was always a good child. He was always uh, a child that respected and honored his parents. 
because that's part of God's will or laws, right? And there's nothing bad or evil in him. Okay. Now, Jesus, at that time, um, did not say, oh, I'm so sorry, mom and dad, I made a mistake, uh, next time I'll be good. No, his answer was, did you not know that I had to be in, the, in father's house? This is my father's house. Joseph might have been really surprised. Well, we never told him that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, that he's not my own biological child. And he says, this is my father's house. And this is the house of God. And you call him your father? Um, Or maybe uh, because of the uh, because the Bible does not talk about this, we have to utilize our imagination, right? Maybe from the beginning, because an angel appeared in his dream and told him, you know, do not get divorced with Mary because the child that she's conceived with is a child conceived by the Holy Spirit, and so go and take her as your wife. And because he had this dream, maybe when he heard that, uh, maybe as much as it was it, it was surprising. He might have understood what that means, but uh, we don't know. Mary probably had a better idea because he, he, she had met visitations from angel, from an angel, um, Gabriel, and uh, um, she actually was filled by the Holy Spirit. Started singing this uh, um, song um, that uh, magnifies the Lord. Whatever the reason is. Because this boy, it, in other sense, like except his birth and the fact that he is perfectly obedient to the laws of God, um, there's nothing really different about him, right? And so they probably sometimes were confused and they, were, they just raised him, treated him the same as his younger brothers who are, uh, who are truly bio biological uh, children of Mary and Joseph. And uh, um, they treated him like one of one of their boys, and that's that's because that's why they were so concerned when he disappeared, right? So they were like, Jesus, why are you doing this to us? Why are you not following us? We thought we lost you. And he goes, Did you not know that I needed to be in my father's house? Jesus had this keen sense of understanding. Uh, even as a little boy, he understood very clearly that he is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah, that he had a purpose, and he needed to fulfill that purpose for the human humanity. And he understood that God was his Father, God is his Father, and that he is in perfect unity and love relationship with him. So his identity was very firm and clear. Now back to Genesis 1, let us make humankind in our image. Yeah, so we talk about this. Now, let's go on to number two. Why did God create human beings then? Um, the first human beings called Adam and Eve, right? The purpose was so that they may rule over the creation. Well, doesn't God have all the power and authority and wisdom to be able to rule over his creation? Absolutely, you better believe it, right? And he is actually in charge. He is in charge. But you know what? This blue earth, the Garden of Eden, um, he wanted Adam and Eve to assume a similar similar role. Okay, so it's like this. Um, say, you know. Uh, parents own a business and it's a big big business and uh, they want their beloved child say I don't want to be I don't want to be um, uh, I, I'm not discriminating against anyone but you know let's say a son okay because um, in this image of Trinitarian perspective um, you know it's all males right for a good reason for a good reason, not because God is male. No, God doesn't have a gender. Gender. The reason he created male and female is because he has both male and female aspects to himself. 
But because the Bible describes him as he, uh, let's say, okay, this couple who owns a business has a son. Okay, the son actually um, is just a kid, right? He is only like three. He's only like five and um, has no ability whatsoever to be able to inherit in this business and run it. But the parents love him so much that he, uh, they want him to be involved in a certain way. Does that make sense to you? We cherish our son so much that we want to make him look like somebody, you know, somebody in our uh, business. And so um, they may take him to special events like a promotion events or when the news reporters actually come and interview, they may actually uh, show the entire family, you know, including the son like this as the future uh, CEO, you know, uh, or the owner. Um, now, the child has like absolutely no idea, but um, the parents cherish him so much that in their hearts, they already let him lead, right? So by the time he turns um, 13, 14, 15, what do they start doing? They start telling him, you know, uh, you're going to actually own this business, like you hope you're going to inherit. Um, this business and we want you to actually um, continue to run this business, make it even bigger, make more franchises and uh, be more influential, right? And so they may give him certain training, like, um, I don't know, um, basic accounting, you know, start actually calculating your expenses, you know, we'll give you pocket money, now you start uh, recording your expenses, income, and kind of plan. Um, why don't you plan for this family camping? You know, we want you to uh, learn how to plan. And of course, the parents are always available as a wisdom and resources. You know, whenever the child is stuck, uh, we're all, oh, you know what? Uh, it's gonna be a three-day camping, but um, how much do we need in order to budget ourselves? How much for the gas? How much for the food? Um, how much for the you know the campsite? How much for the um, you know uh, the extra meals that we're going to have, and and so he sits down and um, try to calculate, but you know he will not be perfect, especially the first time. And the parents come around and kind of see and encourage him. Oh, good job! You know how did you not come up with this number? But uh, have you thought about this aspect? Oh, have you thought about that aspect? Okay, so now our monthly income is this. How uh, many percent? Like what's the percentage? Um, should we spend on leisure per se um, versus how much should be should be going into back, back into the business um, to generate revenue um, how much should we reserve you know for emergencies things like that and so then the, this child is like oh you know i did not have this kind of big picture before but you know when to learn and so this child actually learns to plan um, manage budget and control and evaluate um, over time. Now, this child becomes a college student, so then um, his parents actually give him responsibilities. Okay, now um, go to this um, job fair you know, and observe the employees. I can stand in the uh, booth and help out, you know, uh, introducing the company to other people. Now, uh, why don't you come to the company at 8 o'clock tomorrow and actually sit at a desk and start doing this. Um, you know, sit with the uh, front desk person and see like how many visitors we, uh, we have and what kinds of people we're in communication with, we contact with. Do some research about other companies that are competitors. And so they might give, give him certain um, assignments, small assignments um, that he probably will not fail too, too easily. However, um, they give him greater and greater responsibilities until he becomes a responsible adult who demonstrates um, responsibility, who demonstrates uh, care for the employees, and who demonstrates um, accuracy, uh, who demonstrates um, uh, certain skills. You know? Then they start gradually giving him greater and greater responsibilities. Okay, now uh, open up this small store in our company's name and try running it. Okay. And so well, the point that I'm trying to make is this. 
parents can do a much, much, much better job running the business and uh, maybe the child will make mistakes here and there. Maybe the first time this child um, opens up a small store, maybe he, his business will close, you know, will fail. Um, just like many, uh, most of the businesses actually fail the first time and second time on, uh, it becomes a success, right? Now, um, then why do the parents actually give them responsibilities like when they could have done a better job, right? Uh, it's because they love him. Uh, they want him to inherit the inheritances and they want him to uh, look like a leader. They want him to actually take part in increasing in the family business, um, be an active member um, of the household uh, in terms of leading this business. Now, um, it might be an in imperfect illustration, um, but for um, lack of better words or illustration, I would say God is doing something similar to it. Adam and Eve, they have like, they're oblivious. <laughs> um, God wants them, part of the reason he created them is to, to uh, let them actually run the business, run, run the uh, kingdom business, um, and uh, represent God on this earth uh, for his goodness, for his mercy and grace, for his care, um, for his rulership, um, to bring good to the earth, and actually uh, have mastery over them, to, 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 to take care, care, take good care of them, but also um, to let them be used for God's purposes, so that the creation will be used for God's purposes rather than other purposes, or like, um, perhaps selfish human, human purposes. They were supposed to protect the garden too from the evil one, because God isn't God the protector for us. But um, they miserably failed in that aspect, which we're going to talk about uh, next session. Now, um, God created them, male and female. Um, it's really important that He did not create one human being and said, you know, why don't you multiply? You know, like uh, certain animals, you know, they don't have to get married, like they don't need another. Uh, they don't need a mate, they can actually reproduce by themselves, yeah? Um, however, God made human beings male and female uh, for a good reason, because um, I briefly mentioned the fact that God has both male and female aspects himself, um, and um, he, in, in three verses, really, really loved their perfect harmony, really, really loved their beautiful, harmonious relationship, he wanted to duplicate that by creating human beings. And he created male and female so that when they're together and joining together, they will be a perfect reflection of God's image. So um, we're going to talk about this uh, probably next time. But the first thing, before he, I mean, although his purpose was that they rule over the creation, before he gave that responsibility to them, he actually let them get married. You know, when Adam actually woke up from his sleep and he saw Eve, the first thing that he said was, you are truly uh, my, uh, the, the bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. What, what does that mean? Well, not only Eve was literally taken out of the rib um, on the side, but that means truly you are supposed to be my partner, my spouse. We're supposed to be in that perfect unity that Trinity, Trinity uh, reflects. You and I are a perfect match. You and I are designed so that we will be joined together, produce synergy, that uh, we would reflect God's love, His justice, um, his grace and mercy in and through our relationship is what he's saying. Now, God bless them. This is very important because.
surprising me, some of the people that I've met, they're doubting. Does God even like me? No. So many bad things have happened in my life. Does God even like me? Does God care about me? Some people ask me that question. Um, I myself have gone through that kind of question before. Does God care about me? You know, if God cares about me, like how can these things happen? So these are tough questions, and I, I will not try to answer it in simple terms. But um, some people actually feel that God is really far away. He is uh, like a clock maker who uh, created his uh, people, his creation, his universe, and then just set it and uh, let him go, and that's it. Like he doesn't really closely intervene, and he's not really interested in in my in the details of my daily life, um, like what I'm interested in, and you know, the small, uh, maybe the big decisions he intervenes, but small decisions and my daily thoughts, like he doesn't care. Uh, some people feel that way. No, but, but it's so not uh, true. If we reflect those thoughts, um, you know, if we actually compare those thoughts um, to the word of God, the truth of God, the truth of God says, God is near, God is closer when we are going through difficult times. God cares about us. Cast all your worries uh, because God cares for us, right? Um, so uh, God not only likes us, He blesses us. And sometimes our physical circumstances or our emotional state may uh, send us other messages. We may feel like, oh, you know what? I actually um, feel like God does not bless me. That um, you know, God's so far away. This, this, this might be not uh, the the feelings that we have. However, or thoughts that we have. However, the Bible says God created male and female and blessed them. When God blesses people, you gotta believe that big things coming, uh, big things come. Um, we bless each other with words and actions, and you know, um, I don't know if you've ever been um, in a church setting where um, I'm trying to come up with a good illustration. Okay, so because you are primarily a student, uh, let's talk about graduation. So, of course we have graduations, well, I'm talking about before COVID-19, um, there were graduation ce uh, celebrations, ceremonies, right, uh, in each campus, and it's a big day for especially certain people. Um, I'm really sorry if um, some of the students actually don't have their parents uh, coming to their graduation for whatever reason, geographical uh, reason, maybe they're sick or they disown their children or whatever the reason is, it could be a very sad experience, right? But then um, the vast majority of the parents will actually show up because they're proud, right? And um, so they attend the ceremony, it's really um, honoring to wear this uh, cap and gown and you receive that uh, diploma. And uh, after that uh, elaborate ceremony, you go for a very, very nice lunch or dinner, depending on like, when your ceremony was. And there you invite your friends and family members, um, relatives, you know, um, and they all say something good about your accomplishment, you know, congratulations. Um, now uh, we uh, we're very pleased, we're very happy that you came to this point and you're going to be very successful in the future as well. They say thanks to encourage you and the food is great and um, they may have, have an, even decorations you know, all over the place and uh, you feel kind of cared for, you feel blessed in that situation, right? Now, God's blessings are much, much greater than that, much, 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 much greater than that. It's beyond our imagination. And so sometimes we think of God as very small. Um, we expect Him to perform almost the things that, that we can we can make happen. Yeah. Um, I used to have this like small perspective. You know, God can do good great things, but you know, if, even if He doesn't, then I'll be faithful to Him still, which is a good attitude. But sometimes along with that, 
we had this, I don't know, uh, maybe, maybe our past experiences or maybe something, the wrong, you know, the, the wrong teaching that we've learned from church, from doctrines, we sometimes don't expect to, don't expect God to do anything great in our lives. But when God blesses people, then all the doors will be open and all the things that are beyond our capacity, our imagination, um, that are good will happen. Now, God blessed the first human beings and He hasn't changed His mind when He created you and me. He is keeping to bless us. And throughout this week, my prayer is that you will be blessed. You will experience what kind of blessings that God gives you. Now, um, fill the earth and subdue it. Yeah, yes, they may rule over the, the creation. Here's another word, fill the earth. I want you to multiply because the, the reason I created you is to um, is to uh, duplicate, to replicate um, our perfect relationship through you. Now, why don't you uh, bear many children, and their children, your children, will bear many children. Fill the earth. I like you. I like your relationship. Now, fill the earth. And of course, after them failing uh, miserably, did God stop that plan? You know, oh, they have, they are so corrupt and they have changed. They're not pure anymore. They're not faithful to me. And they are, they fell out of this uh, love relationship with me. Now, forget it. Now, don't fill the earth. Don't rule it. No, he didn't change his plan. He's so kind and patient that he comes up with a plan B in order to restore them, in order to bring restoration uh, to the all human time, which we're gonna talk about later. Now, on the sixth day, this is what happened. He created human beings. That was his final work day out of the seven. Seventh day he uh, rested, and which we're gonna, we're gonna talk about next time. But now, um, the sixth day, why the last day? The last day was important because um, I've used this illustration before, so I'm going to kind of repeat it and probably you'll be uh, reminded of the passive illustration. Now, um, if you have your own child or if you are expecting to get married and have a child, if you have any aunts and uncles who have, um, who, who have given birth to a child or if you have any neighbor was pregnant and gave birth, you probably know about this. Okay, so what happens when the, uh, the mother is very much pregnant, like month seven, what, what does she do? She goes out to uh, the to stores, you know, um, and starts buying uh, the baby materials, okay? Uh, even before that, they might have prepared a room, you know, uh, separately for the baby, and they might have decorated the room. They might have uh, prepared a crib, right? Baby crib, baby bottles, diapers. Mom goes to the store, dad goes to the store. Um, and they start picking up like other essentials and even non-essential things. Okay, so essentials like clothes, diapers, but non-essentials like uh, fancy toys. Like, okay, this child is not even born, but they start buying fancy toys. Uh, they start buying like, Picture books, <laughs> the baby's not born yet. And this picture book is for three-year-olds. And they're like, oh, you know, my child is going to read like this. And by the time he turns five, he has mastered the encyclopedia. I'm just exaggerating you know, a little bit. But they're so excited. And they just go ahead and they just plan ahead, right? And they buy things and prepare everything in anticipation of the fact that this baby is coming. And so God did the same thing as father. As a parent, um, he actually um, prepared this universe. He created the light, the energy. He created the visible lights, sun, moon, and stars. He created heaven and the earth. He created the oceans um, and the sky. He created, uh, you know, the plants and um, trees. Created uh, fish and all the animals, birds in the sky. And finally, he created the human beings because all these things were preparation. 
in anticipation of these two babies coming. And so um, that's why they say it was very good. When parents of, uh, you know, uh, anticipating mothers and uh, fathers, when they see this room filled with everything that baby is going to enjoy and be utilizing, they're like, yes. that's how um, God thought of it. Now, we actually covered uh, Genesis 1 pretty much, but now um, let's uh, keep talking about Latin Vulgate. So it's on page two of uh, chapter one, Latin Vulgate. Uh, obviously, it's the um, prototype of uh, Italian language, right? Latin, Latin Vulgate. This is the Bible that was written in Latin. It was written in the fifth century. Okay. Jerome, commissioned by Pope Damascus I in 382 to revise the ultra Latin translations. Okay, so it was during Pope and Damascus. So Christianity was uh, largely established, and around 300, um, Christianity actually became uh, um, the state religion of uh, the Roman Empire, meaning the Roman Empire first uh, persecuted Christians. They killed so many of them. They imprisoned so many of them. Um, they did not allow them to gather. And so they were meeting secretly, like, like in house churches and catacombs and things like that. But later on, they found out this pattern. We killed so many Christians, so many believers. Now the number is increasing because these people who are being killed, they don't deny Christ and try to live. Their faith is genuine. And so whenever they die, it's a bigger testimony for other people. And they're like, oh, if they believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior, even at the risk of their life, and they rather die than deny the faith, then this must be really important. This must be true. And we've got to believe it. You know, it, it becomes a wider and greater testimony. And so the number grew explosively. Now, then they changed their mind kind of strategically, the Roman Empire. Okay, if this uh, number is going to grow, then let's hop on it <laughs> and take advantage of it. And so they actually uh, released a law saying um, if you, it's going to be a membership program, all right? So it's going to be a privilege if you become. So behind all these uh, politics and, you know, uh, policies um, were Satan's scheme. Satan tried persecuting the church through people, through the Roman Empire. However, he saw that the number grew, and then he ch quickly changed his mind. He's very smart. Uh, he existed before us. He started uh, deceiving Adam and Eve from the beginning uh, of creation, right? Now, um, he changed his strategy and said, I am going to actually deceive them and corrupt them, like instead of persecuting them, because persecution does not work. Now, what I'm going to do is uh, corrupt their minds, make them feel very comfortable. And well, this is going to, I'm going to just mix their values with the worldly values. I'm going to mix, mix, and really contaminate their hearts so that the church will fall. And you know what? The second strategy actually worked much better. And so the Roman Empire actually adopted uh, Christianity as their um, state religion. And anybody who joined the membership of Christian religion uh, would be privileged, you know, have like tax privileges, would uh, be protected from certain things, and they, they had so much gain uh, by becoming a member. And the, therefore, uh, there were so many people who wanted to become a Christian just for the privilege, right? If you have good deals in a, a grocery market, if you have a good deal about your cell phone plans or um, anything, right? If you, if you see a good deal, you want to buy it out, right? And so people started buying the membership. And therefore, people, uh, there were so many people who were in the church who showed up uh, to fulfill their membership requirements. However, their hearts were not seeking God. They, did, they didn't have an interest. They were not interested in getting to know God, becoming saved, and they did not care about um, the eternal life at all, but to just uh, tangibly benefit from the membership program they joined Christianity. And therefore, when you went to church, probably more than half of the people were 
people who came there for to take advantage, right, for worldly gain. And so then the church uh, became powerless because so many people did not know Christ. And when you don't have a personal relationship with God, then um, you operate just the same as the world, and it actually takes a toll, um, toll on um, the church. Now, uh, so this was happening while, uh, when Latin Vulgate was uh, written. Uh, Pope Damascus actually um, commissioned Jerome to revise the older translation. The, the Latin Vulgate's Old Testament, the first Latin version, translated directly from the Hebrew Tanakh. Okay? So, uh, Latin Vulgate did not find its route to Greek Septuagint, Septu Septuagint but rather it was direct. Uh, translation from the Hebrew uh, Bible. The officially um, homogulated Latin version of the Roman Catholic Church. So actually when the Pope ordered uh, translation, now uh, it was written in Latin, um, and um, at that time only the priests, only the popes and priests, uh, bishops, they were able to read the Latin because there was high illiteracy rates. And even the people in the Roman Empire did not have access to the Bible. And um, because of illiteracy, but also because they deliberately, uh, they meaning the Roman Empire, deliberately, and the, and the Pope, you know, the, the religious leaders, uh, wanted to keep their status quo. They wanted to remain um, authoritarian, authoritative. Uh, they wanted to remain in high positions, like, um, there has to be something that they held on to like this and can be done only by us and therefore you'd better respect us, you'd better follow, you'd better submit to us. That was like a, a tool to manipulate the population and so they deliberately kept the Bibles so that lay people would not have access to it. And people could, even if they had hunger and thirst for God's word, they had to come to you know, come to church in order to hear the word, and somebody had to translate that for him, for for, for them, uh, in lay terms, right? Um, and Latin Vulgate actually became the uh, the official Bible of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, um, there's a German Bible and um, English Bible, which we can talk about next time, but. Um, why are we talking about a different version of the Bible? Because I want you to know the history of how it came into our hands. We now can go to any stores and online stores and easily uh, purchase an English version of the Bible. But uh, it was not so. It was very, um, it was a scary, scarce commodity. It was very, um, it was available only for the privileged people to have access to the Bible. So I'm really thankful that now uh, we're not, not only living in the era of grace, because Jesus already came, things are more clear, much more clear than in the past when Jesus did not come. But also, the Word of God is available to us, um, and we should cherish it. We should, um, we should focus on it. There's so much treasure in it, so, so much mystery, um, so much beauty. It's a lamp unto our feet, and light into our path. So um, this coming week, I want to um, encourage all of you to turn to the Bible and uh, maybe start with Psalm, Proverbs, you know, or Genesis, um, or the book of John. Uh, I highly recommend. So um, let's close with our prayer and uh, be healthy until we meet again next time. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time of uh, knowing you, of hearing your word, and uh, Lord, uh, I pray that your word always inspire us, Lord, that we will not be complacent, that we will not be dull and numb, but rather widely awakened to your call. Um, help us be renewed with your word uh, every time. And Lord, we want to know your teaching. And so as we continue with the sessions, Father God, I ask you that you will inspire us by the Holy Spirit and that you will uh, awaken our uh, souls, so that we may respond to your call. We may hear your word and uh, respond and uh, obey, so that we may be blessed, so that we may receive 
all the blessings that you have in store for us so that we can experience you better on this earth. Father God, we thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.